good morning. <laughs> I'm doing something I never do. I, I never, 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 never smoke in bed. I mean, never. Um, not even when I'm alone. I'm unsupervised. As now. Uh, but this morning seems to be a morning for doing things I never do. Um, or things I, I, I have a resistance with. Huh. So the laptop talk topic. Laptop talk topic. Wow, what a tongue twister for this time of the morning. Bear with me. Ooh, cigarette hopefully helps me wake up a little. Although I kind of want to do this one sleepy because I don't like it. At least at this point. I'll tell you why. So the, so the topic... Um, is, is just basically the what is Tantra topic. Uh, I've been teaching mm, more than 10, less than 20 years. And for the last 20 years or so around uh, checking out what information is available, um, the arguments out there are all pretty much the same now as they were 20 years ago. And they go on and on, what is Tantra? And uh, welcome to the internet and the whole bun fight around that and arguing the same things endlessly, circularly with little encampments of entrenched points of views around the Facebook groups and Twitter these days and that stuff. Uh, anyway, uh, I guess that that's why I don't like the topic. Um, also, uh, Back when, many years ago, when I did play with that a little bit, um, I saw pretty quickly that the, <laughs> the views I expressed that people could get uh, very quickly ended up in their sort of marketing propositions for whatever they were selling. And uh, uh, fair enough, okay. Um, but uh, my view, my feeling, I mm. mm, have to stop on it a little bit from time to time or it goes out, huh? Oh, I don't do endorsements ever, ever, but oh. One reason I'm having a cigarette this morning is I woke up dreaming of having a cigarette. Uh, just too delicious, too delicious, too delicious. Take a quick look. Uh. Hmm. So I think the only way to take it on is, if you're interested in what I've written and so on, uh, quite a bit I've taken down recently from websites, so I might make it available for historic use, or I don't know if anyone has curiosity in the comments, so I'll, I'll post old things there. Um, but I'm not going to engage with that argument the only way I can really find the willingness to do this. Um, and yet, I should kind of um, <laughs> tell you what my view is, so you can and maybe start looking around a little bit, because my view is hardly likely to make sense at first. Um, and I'll talk a bit about my Tantra. Let's see.
No idea how much time this thing will record for either, or how long its battery will last. Mm. Okay. So, what I regard as Tantra, or particularly Tantric, in its quality is a teaching that um, in the old uh, in the particular Tibetan Buddhist world a teaching that was not for general consumption um, when I'm talking about Tantra in the kind of exclusive sense as in those things that are Tantra that are not part of other things. Um, it's really the difference between monastic path and, you know, wild wandering Tantrika path. Tibet's, of course, a confusing place to draw those stories from because Tibet has this very interesting historical crossover of tantric and yet monastic. You get monasteries with an attitude of their approach is tantric. Um, wow. Maybe a topic all for something of its own, that. Um, but in general, the difference between the approaches is monastic path um, the best of them use methods that a group moves together or a community even moves together over time and the sort of combined energies of the seekers in that community advances them more than they could have advanced possibly as individuals um, using the group energy that's really the essence of monastic practice. Um, now, wow. It's a cigarette. In the country I'm in, at the time I'm in now, in my home environment, I feel pretty at home here. Um, I'd be allowed to smoke things that would dry my mouth out, but my mouth is drying out anyway, even though that's just what I showed you, that very, very particularly delicious tobacco. Wow. Who knows, maybe it's one of those things that would be nice for a week, passing taste. Um, water, 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 water. Oops. Ah, okay. Let's see if I can get the water bottle out. Ah, I did, without disturbing the laptop too much. The essential distinctions for me when I'm, you know, when I talk about Tantra, really it's about the distinction between the Tantric approach and the monastic approach. That's this particular distinction. Maybe we get to a couple of others. So I've described the monastic approach a little bit. The monastic approach because of that group energy, it's working with community. Now, the tantric approach is getting one's lessons in the world. Um, I think you get the idea if I 
tell you what the good monks are told. If one said to the good monks, there's another path, it doesn't involve coming into the monastery, it's got uh, a whole other angle to it. It's faster, it's more bruising, it's more intense, it's harsher, it's potentially more exciting because of that, you know, exciting and interesting, really interesting in the sense of the Chinese curse as well. Um, but it's, it's quicker. Um, and at the extreme of it, there's some schools, and, and perhaps this could be really a defining, for me, a defining characteristic of Tantra, some schools who use methods and have an intention towards enlightenment in one lifetime, towards completing the path but good monks, you know, you've, you've got this monastic situation where you work as a group energy together and you advance together. It's more supportive of you, it's more supportive of your progress. Tantra, that extreme path is, is not necessarily supportive of your progress. Uh, the, if you get misguided there or wrongly guided, you could stumble into methods that will really break you. Um, could be very bad. Then any good monk with any spirit hearing that, he'd, he'd feel pretty obligated to take it on. And that would be a cruelty, a wrong approach. So the way it's more intelligently put to the good monks is good monks, you've, you've managed this uh, submission, this lifetime in which you've been able to find the possibility of making this submission to the Buddha, the Sangha, the Dharma, claiming those refuges, the Buddha, the Sangha, the Dharma, and you're now included in this community and it's a sign of your evolution as beings that you can do this, that you can reach this point. Oh, nice little splash. But spare a thought for, you know, those who don't have incarnations where they're, you know, evolved enough, like you, to be able to make this commitment for seven years, the rest of your life, whatever the vow is. And also a spare thought for those of you, there may be some of you here who, who just, you know, can't really fit monastic ways and, you know, essentially are, could be a disturbance to the community. And we'd have to kind of let them go. And for, for them, for those, for those ones. Um, the Buddha, in his compassion, created an, an alternative path. They're not left completely out in the darkness. They have methods, but it doesn't involve your methods. It doesn't involve coming to your things, learning things your way. I mean, they, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of outside of what we do in the secrets and in the practices and in the ways of our monastery. That's how our path progresses. But those, those ones who can't fit in here and those ones who can't make it here, for them, you know, there's the Tantras. And I urge you to take that quite seriously if you're thinking of playing with Tantra. You know, um, in the West, uh, generally you're fairly safe because what you're likely to encounter of it or what you will encounter of it um, what is out there um, very little of it indeed is dangerous to a seeker dangerous to 
one who is running the big questions of life. And of course everyone hears that and thinks, I am a seeker. Um, I think I'll talk a little bit more about this monastic distinction first, then we'll get on to the distinctions of who and what should play with what of Tantra, and who shouldn't play with what of Tantra, and so on. Um, So in this distinction of monastic path and tantric path, I like the, the Buddhist version of it, or this particular version that I'm telling. Buddhism is large. And tantra is arguably larger. So what happens to a monk who makes that commitment, goes into a monastic environment and keeps asking all the inconvenient questions, keeps jumping four levels of study ahead because he's been dipping into the advanced books in the library and such like and generally being um, inconvenient in the tribal energy, bonded, classroom, class together, unity thing that the, monast you know, the monastic guys are trying to work with. Well, what happens to him is, uh, ideally, in the old world model of it, he's, he's kicked out. Um, <laughs> uh, when he became a monk, he, he got, he, what a monk gets, it's called, called the refuges. He gets the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. The Buddha means he gets the icon of the Buddha, you know, an object of devotion, an object of intention, an object, something to put your spiritual intentions and focusing towards. Mm, want that quality, what would, you know, for a Christian, what would Jesus do, etc. What would, you know, Buddha have to say about this? What would Buddha advise me? What would, you know, the Buddha in me want? Um, the Buddha, that icon. The Sangha, the commune, the community, the community of seekers, the combined energy of the monastery, uh, the Buddha field, of the Buddha in the monastery that supports the whole energy of this place. Also the, you know, psychologically important mind training lessons, service under the irritable cook in the kitchen. <laughs> Cleaning things, etc. Monastic things, things that, doing all the things that have to be done in a monastic context. Those are the lessons of the Sangha, the community, the commune, the refuge of it. You live there, you eat there. That refuge. And the third refuge, the Dharma. Not the way I, when I say Dharma, I'm usually referring to the, that which is beyond your senses, beyond your greed, beyond your consensual reality, the Dharma, the actuality. Now, uh, the, the Buddhist Dharma, the Dharma is the Buddha's teachings of that. You have the Buddha's teachings, the Buddha's guides to the Dharma, and the guides of all the Buddhas to the Dharma. You've got their guide, that, you know, their, their texts, their understandings, the practices taught down their lineages, you get that. And so now, if you, one of those inconvenient ones, asking all the wrong questions, pushing all the wrong buttons, showing up as not being uh, entirely uh, suited for the monastic way, then you get the tantric path, assuming you want a path. So they kick you out and they strip you. Gone. 
of your three refuges. No more Buddha for you. No more commune for you. <laughs> no more Dharma for you. No more teachings. And you say, well, presumably this, this, uh, so if I take the tantric path, you know, um, is it now just, what, into a, a void of where are the teachings, uh, presumably there's some structure, and they say, well, just the same, you, you have the substitutes for the three refuges, we don't really call them refuges because <laughs> they're not really refuges, the monastery's the refuges, you're going out, so there's no refuge, that's part of Tantra. I say, okay, so what do I get? Well, if you want a substitute for the Buddha, what do you mean? Can't still want to be the Buddha? No. Can't hold the Buddha as the icon? No. Not meditate on the pure nature of the Buddha? No. Okay, no Buddha. Right, no Buddha. Oops. For a Buddhist, that's kind of weird, huh? Anyway. <laughs> so then if I don't get Buddha then, then you know some kind of substitute well yeah well okay so so what's the substitute then for the Buddha well um, ever heard of Tara ah, Hindu goddess kind of uh, Firm, yeah, yeah, ever heard of Kali? Yeah, heard of her. Hmm. Well, all the Hindu deities, yeah, yeah, pick your goddess, you know. Pick your goddess. No Buddha, a goddess. Yeah. But, like, Okay, let's say I'm a man, I could imagine myself becoming the Buddha. What must I imagine myself becoming the goddess? No, 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 no. You love the goddess. Your devotion is the goddess. Uh, just like when the Buddhist's devotion reaches the point where the, you know, his devotion to the Buddha is so total that it's, he, physic he feels it's physical. Yeah, he meets the Buddha, he can hug him. At that point, he must kill him. Same with you and the goddess. The point at which you make love with her, that if actually she kills you, but you know, similar, but a little different. Mm. Okay, so goddess instead of Buddha. Yeah. Okay, sangha, commune. You know, there's communes. You can go to these tantrikas. Well, kind of yes and no, not really. The commune for Tantrika, the Sangha, is the world. Yeah. There it is. Big, wide world, full of people running around doing all their things. If you're a tantrika, it means your energy rises beyond the level of the pasha, the, those who can barely raise their energy to doing more or less what they're told they should do. And beyond the vira, those who see some of the gaps and see some of the advantages to be taken in the world and take advantage of those little advantages, whatever they are, and, you know, could say, progress in their lives. Uh, call the one sheep, call the other the wolves, predating a bit on the sheep. Wolves and wolves and sheep dogs. Predating, managing the sheep. Uh, that's the world. You go into it, you find your way to make your living. You predate a little bit on the basha if it is that, you know, you sell them stuff they don't need or whatever, draw them pretty pictures, charge them money, whatever, you find your way, you know. All the things the Sangha would give you, the commune, yeah, you get that in the world. You get all the lessons of the irritable boss and the 
finding self in service. Mm. And all sorts of great lessons that the monastery teaches, but you get them at world speed, which is a little quicker. Monasteries go slow. Mm. Okay. And what was that about the Dharma? No, oh, well, the teachings of the Buddha don't really apply his guidelines, the meditations he's suggesting for monks. Um, no, those those kind of manuals, those handbooks, are no, not your thing anymore. Hmm. Okay. So is there a Tantra guide, a Tantra manual, Tantra handbook, whatever? Mm, yes, there's many, but that's not really the the guide, the handbook. I mean, you know, that that's yes, helpful, good background for you. Maybe helps you spot archetypes, get where you know, when you're in the flow, when you're in the drift, things like that. Good help. But not really, no. You don't you don't you don't you don't really have texts. So then what do you get? Well you get <laughs> Uh, some Swamiji, some Guruji who knows some bit of the path that you learn a bit from and then you find another one and you maybe learn a bit more from him or her and you know you find a yogini here and there and you know take on some practices try them out see what works for you and uh, so on and maybe you find your way to the guidance of a Guruji or a, or a Dakini um, and uh, uh, then uh, you know they, they they help maybe with their overview on the path and where you are in it and what you're moving to next and you know can give you a bit of assistance but that's what you get uh, if you can find them and and you know maybe there's some hints maybe there's some rumors to start on but like that's it good luck Tantrikas don't work well long term. Can't learn long term. They can learn the lessons of a spiritual community, yes. They'll generally learn those lessons at a way quicker pace than anyone in that community. They'll be jumping ahead, interpolating, grabbing the advanced books, etc., way ahead of time. And then they'll be out of there. And. Uh, very often they'll even be grumpy or nasty about where they've been. Um, when they see the holes in in the teaching, then you know they'll very be very critical about it afterwards. <laughs> I know these things because I have been that tantrika. To my regret sometimes, because no, it's not about hitting the things that many of those things are useful for those who are more, you know, monastic inclined. <coughs> you know, go to their yoga class because mm, their friends go, they've paid for it, etc., etc. Um, tantricas don't take lessons long. They're rushed to the condition called mastery very quickly with pretty much everything they study. Mastery doesn't mean best in the world at it, or high grade in it. Mastery means doesn't have to go to school anymore. Um, has become self-guiding, self-responsible for one's learning. That is mastery. Mm. Um, so an analogy that comes up there. You might not know the martial arts world well, but it's not hard to understand. And mm, uh, one doesn't, perhaps, maybe you don't have the same, if you have any reactiveness around sexual issues, maybe to look across at violence, you know, we, we have trigger warnings and worry about sexual things, but violent things we're, we're less concerned. Um, 
if we compare, we take sex as a cultural taboo and violence as a cultural taboo, where Tantra goes in terms of using sexual energies is very similar to where martial arts goes in terms of using violent energies. We've seen, we've got a history of martial arts coming from east to west. We can see now in overview, 2020 hindsight and all, how it went down. For the last, I don't know, um, 100 years and bits and pieces and uh, last 30 years really intensively, 40 years, um, Tantra has also been heading towards the West. They have great similarities. Let me explain. So martial arts started out with someone who journeyed to the East um, or learned a little bit of the Boxer's Rebellion and researched a little bit of uh, the weapons used or something like that. You know, playing with friends, being an enthusiast, starting small clubs, things like that. Um, you know, people who'd seen uh, more or less a Bruce Lee movie and now we're, uh, you know, decided that they're a sensei of nunchaku who's uh, once they've got through hitting themselves on the head a bit and like taught people how to use them and so on and so on. And some of them were good and some of them were bad and that, that was the extent of reach right over, say, in the Californian end or, you know, from, from the marsh. Well, California had maybe better access around the other side of the world to the martial arts. And uh, also, you know, go to war with the people. Well, you know, you're really inviting their culture into your culture. You can look at that as a historical trend too. So, so martial arts came in quite quickly and quite well. And fairly soon you had teachers referring back to the East. And in the East it was well developed. It was a strong, well developed art. Many practitioners. Where it gets similar to Tantra is that kind of violence, that kind of um, training isn't for everyone. And training beyond uh, a, first, a first black belt is really not for everyone. You know, relatively few people, um, you know, become a, a true shodan, a true, a true first dan in the sense of they're now self-responsible for their own teaching. When they arrive at school, it's because they feel like taking a class or they're there to teach a class. Um, you know, but but in, 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 in essence, they're responsible for their own learning, their own guidance. Now, in martial arts, that makes sense because if you come from a school, you've had its lessons, well, then anyone fighting you from any other school knows the particular vulnerabilities of your school and so on. And in your mastery of it, in your time training alone, essentially, you're supposed to fill in those gaps, check out other schools, flesh out your technique, adapt it, make it more truly yours, etc. That's 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 the things you'll be doing. Anyway, those similarities aside, the similarities in terms of the cultural taboo. Hmm. The culture has a taboo against sex, yes. The culture has a taboo against violence, yes. However, police do not go and raid in most civilized countries. Do not go and raid martial arts schools because crimes are happening there on a regular basis and people are taught how to be good at managing themselves in the zone of crime called violence. Mm. I've got news for you. At a high level in martial arts training, people really, really hit each other. I mean, with a severity. And it's not, not by 
accident. Hmm? A friend of mine, married to a doctor, took a Taekwondo fourth dan grading. And uh, she looked at his body afterwards, after just going through the procedure, the proving of body that that grading involves. And uh, she said to him, it's, 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 it's good, you've got a really strong liver, because I've seen people die of significantly less bruising than this. You know. And he did not only not die, he was quite healthy and kept on training after it and healed up the bruising from that. And that's part of the proving and the grade of such a grade in martial arts. <laughs> They make supermen. They, they eat different from the rest of us. They live different from the rest of us. They train way different from the rest of us. They do things in their training that the average idiot taking it on would be really, really, really stupid. You know, They really do put sacks on their backs and jump off buildings onto the ground, land in their stance, to enhance the strength of their stance. High-level martial artists do the most ridiculous stuff. Look up the Pumphrey brothers sometime to get an idea of what their body conditioning does. And now people doing those things in our culture, and somehow you know the culture seems to tolerate it, but it is working with stuff that in the normal zone of life is not permitted, and there's laws against it and uh, it's generally a bad thing. And Tantra is extremely similar in terms of the way it works with sexuality. Part of where it has to work with sexuality, these days far more than ever in history, is that uh, people, the world is sexually retarded. There's a, another YouTube video of mine on that topic. Uh, look for the keyword retarded there, you'll find it somewhere. And uh, that retardation <clears throat> basically means that even if you're not individually retarded yourself, you know, it's hard to soar with the eagles if you're surrounded by a bunch of turkeys. Um, the general retardation of the culture will put the brakes on your development. That's how it is. And old world tantra kind of started at a point when people had lived through their eroticism already and were ready for the meditations of tantra and the, the ones that you use sexual energies in. But uh, these days, um, first one has to kind of catch up to where one's development, one's maturity would be sexually, naturally, for your age. Uh, takes my students a couple of years to manage that. It's just a couple of years sometimes a little quicker. Some of them come to me right up to date. My first ones did, pretty much with their naturalness. You know. But the bulk of my teaching is preparing, getting people ready for Tantra, not you know, the higher practices. That's, that's a few of us. That's a few, like in a martial arts class. Many can take lots of good exercises. Very few are really going to be breaking through boards with their foreheads, you know, smashing through concrete, prefabricated vibracrete panels with their shoulders. You know, there's a range. So my tantra is where really um, hmm. oh sorry sleepiness kind of got me in the middle of that so maybe that gives you some idea of Tantra coming to the west the first bits of it we've seen are you know a bit like a Christian who's just heard of Christianity a little bit, and so he names himself Jesus Pope, 
and opens up a, up a synagogue, you know, to start teaching. Uh, there's a lot of that all over the world um, going on. There's a lot of other developments, particularly good old sales training and pumping your body up by engaging your sexual energies. I, there are many old sales training schools that do that. And there are now, some of them just rebranded now as Tantra schools. And fair enough, they're first steps towards getting that naturalness and that recovery back. But that's kind of a bit out of the territory of what I call Tantra. That's stuff that's good for all of those on the monastic path too. Where Tantra starts to get distinct is where it's not good for those on a monastic path. Or here and there, some of the same lessons and approaches. Oh, the pack of wild dog is visiting. Hey, Kaiser. Breakfast time. <laughs> <coughs> mm. <sighs> so the quality I call tantra, tantric methods that are strong, intense, potentially transcendent, etc. Um, that's not confined to old India, that's not confined to, to old Tibet, that's not confined to new little Tibet here, that's, that's, uh, that's any really, really intense strongly involving spiritual practice. And I regard on the Catholic and Opus Dei as Catholic Tantra, as the they work incredibly strongly with the energies of sex. They work with it through, you know, repression, conscious repression. But, you know, close your eyes for a moment, take a breath, and do not picture, do not imagine a Volkswagen Beetle. And all right, open your eyes now. What color was it? Uh -huh. Like that, you know. So walking around, being, knowing you've got to police yourself on every sexual thought, every minute of the day, intensively. And even maybe create some direct pain for yourself if you sh whenever you find such a moment. Oof. Awesome. That'll bring on maturity. It's, it's a hard way. I don't suggest it to any of my students, but uh, but out there. But no, I call that tantric. Not for everyone. Strong practice. Great potential in the practice. Hmm. Possible harm in the practice too. Tantric. The original baptism. Have you noticed that you know, Christians these days don't have the kind of intensity, the kind of spiritual power, that kind of um, thing that now Buddhists are more famous for, the ability, you know, ability to sort of immolate or die in protest quite happily, die in defense of their faith as opposed to kill, you know, that level of kind of giving and courage and saintliness, bodhisattva quality. Um, around death, the Christians seem to have lost it, you know. <laughs> they're all ready to murder you, but they're not so willing to be murdered anymore. And, uh, yeah, a long time ago, I, I've been interested, uh, I, there's a curiosity of mine to discern, like, when exactly, but A long time ago, they kind of papered over what what baptism was and changed it into the thing that even Baptists think baptism is these days, you know, uh, like a dip in the water, a dip. Uh, no, baptism, 
used to be a strong, strong, strong tantric uh, practice, uh, an exploration of death, a deep exploration. And uh, again, quite out there, very total, very intense. Um, wow. Uh, I mean, the way it went was, you know, John says to Jesus, okay, you know, you don't want me to baptize you. Jesus says, no, no, I really do. John says, you're not going to like it. Jesus says, no, no, I've got to do this. John says, well, <laughs> okay, all right, come into the river with me. Gets the guy by the back of the head, and under the water he goes until he's died to the world of the flesh. Died. Stopped wiggling. Mm. Then, put him up on the bank, oh, hopefully pointing downhill in the recovery position. Don't know if they knew that. But put him out there for a while and see, and maybe he is born again to the world of the spirit. Oh, the words are all there, but the actions, the actual ritual <laughs> kind of lost and all the power it used to give kind of lost and maybe that's a good thing um, because those kind of practices are not for everybody you know a little bit like some martial arts practices So who is Tantra, you know, schools that kind of <laughs> go a bit beyond the, 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 the early belts, you know, the low grades, schools that know something. And, uh, you know, who should go near them? And to what extent should those schools put themselves out in the world? Um, well, those schools in martial arts, exactly the same as in Tantra, uh, they advertise and put themselves out uh, not much if they kind of really stick to that business, but more if they have what's called outer teachings, if, if they reach out and that's one of the big challenges of Tantra and, I guess, of a martial arts master, master too. Certainly in the Zen model of it is, how far down the mountain can you reach? How far out can you introduce, suggest, method, and so on, that's useful to people? There's a point at which you can't anymore. You'll you know, lose your own touch, you know, too many layers of translation, so to speak. There's a, there's a level you can't, but how close, you know. Um, so my school of Tantra, we, we engage where, where all seekers can find good use with what we call our, with, with our touch work. And um, You know, that's where people, you know, pass through some feelings on the table and then have less resistance to following their eroticism, you know, which is usually just what's in front of them in life, being a bit obvious or very often, um, and, and kind of get on with it, uh, helping seekers over just the general retardation of sexuality, uh, getting themselves up to something approaching their naturalness with it and their, their natural maturity with it so that they escape the Buddhist prediction of our times that we'd be married at a maturity of five and we'd be only living to a maturity of ten in the general run of humanity. You know, um, that's our outer teachings from their retreats and so on. Retreats tend to be a bit more inner. Um, it's, uh, I, I don't really like having people along on a retreat where, okay, 
I can make or there are options in intense exercises where they can find a, you could say a way of chickening out a milder version etc no problem uh, non-confrontational etc but those strong techniques diluted in that way uh, I'm not always convinced and, and certainly not all of those techniques are actually of use to people at that level of seeking this plenty of uh, other introductory beginner kind of work and, and sure there's going to be some wrong ideas they'll get but they can sort them out later but, you know there's enough um, so I, you know I, I don't I don't really do retreats much with beginners but some teachers in the school here have now started a little bit the first retreat for beginners happened the other day we're now in 2018 round about the beginning of that first beginners retreat beginner methods and and very nice to see that happening but that's a bit beyond me um, I'm not good for beginners <laughs> so who should play with Tantra? well The way I try to arrange it is to kind of fulfill the archetypal obligation to be findable by what I put out online, by the book I've written and so on. And where I get to be also in, well, in the archetype of what I call Tantra. I maintain, in a sense, some degree of secret. Um, nothing you'll find written by me describes the most inner work of the school or describes the sexual meditations of Tantra. And that's weird because 140 beginner schools are all over describing the sexual meditations of Tantra. It's, it's, it's the, all they want to play with because of that Western attitude of you've got to do the best and the most advanced right now, and then you'll be the best and then you're the most advanced. Uh, try that with martial, approach with martial arts, you know. And you'll get very hurt. Try that with Tantra and the same thing can happen. Fortunately, you're not likely to have good methods. <laughs> hmm. So who should play with what around Tantra? Hmm. It comes down to your chi, your level of energy. It is true that all human beings are potentially capable of the same transcendence. However, someone of a naturally low-ish chi, mm. either you could say inclined to themselves in dropping into a low energy condition or just of their physiology and their body and their system, them happening to not be mm, hyp you know, hypothyroidic and very high energy, you know, low of energy in the system, you know. What was it George Collins said, you know, think of how stupid the average person is, then realize 50% of people are stupider even than that. Think of most people, most, most, most people, and most of us for most of the time, our, the energy is low. It doesn't you know, push the world very much, doesn't Tony Robbins the hell out of it all the time. Now, if one pours a tonnage of motivation, use the resources of this whole school to pick on one guy and make it the school's entire project to get him, random guy chosen, get him go transcendent and we mess with his life and push the spiritual lessons his way and ram them through him whichever way it has to go, whether he likes it or not, we'd probably get him there. He'd hate us, like Krishnamurti ended up hating his teachers, but you know, 
people that tend to hate their tantra teachers anyway, because of the hard lessons involved. There has to be some hate involved there. You know, it's not all love, sweetie. Mm. So in that way, yeah, everyone's got the possibility, but only with massive motivation. And if you want to see who someone isn't, motivate him. Uh, You know the difference between when you're motivated and when you are just you. And the chi I'm talking about is the chi of when you're just being you. That chi. If that chi drives you with such an assistance, insistence that the keeping up more or less with what, you know, everyone thinks and everyone knows and the common knowledge and the common wisdom and if your energy brings you to where you see the gaps in that, where you drive yourself through those gaps, you find yourself on the other side of that common knowledge, that common wisdom. And then you find there are other areas of it and you explore and you realize and you find the truth has arisen now that you wouldn't even be able to explain to yourself a while ago the kind of realizations you're having now. Then you're moving with a lot of chi. If your energy takes you into the kind of inquiry where you could go into something monastic, make a study of something, really knuckle down and get into some deep philosophy, or really get into what others would call tantra, um, sexual exploration and discovering the truth of your eroticism and that kind of department of life. Whatever, of, of, uh, you know, then, then your energy takes you to that. If your energy goes beyond that and has an insistence to go further, then you will find what's further. And somewhere out there you'll bump into tantra, worth calling tantra. because it's very easy to see it in others. Everyone around you, if you're a tantrika, will be telling you that, you know, you tend to be a berserker when you do take a thing on. You tend to probably be greatly resistant to taking things on you don't see much sense in. You know, you don't like to do things just because. And... Although you can go into a school and learn and get their degree, you don't necessarily feel that you have uh, been bonded as part of their tribe. You know, you feel an independence. The energy, the chi that's suitable that a tantrika has, the, uh, it can't stay stuck around the second chakra tribal issue stuff. It 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 individuates. The people who come here to Little Tibet and the people who have been coming here on retreats and workshops, the people who have been coming to this country and seeing me in those kind of contexts for a while now, they come, they learn, they go back into the Sangha, their commune, the world. Sometimes it is a commune. And they go take what they've learned, they go try it on their own experience, they go live with it a bit, and they come back, get some more. If we could, if we made a happy little tribe here, then we'd all be a happy little school and we could do the monastic thing. But no, our energy is such that I teach here, Stephen teaches 100 kilometers or so, 200 kilometers that way. Others teach a couple of hundred kilometers that way. That's the kind of spacing that is good for Tantra. No, good to visit. It's like the Zen thing more than the old school Buddha mon Buddhist monastery thing. 
Sanskrits. You, the Tantrika journeys temple to temple, gathers lessons, teacher to teacher. Hmm. Well, that might be my last laptop talk because here yeah, there's no. Um, A couple of friends who may be helping with, you know, better audio rigs and, and as we get built, we're at the moment inside a upcycled 40 foot long refrigerator, con refrigerator container. No refrigeration on it, it was just the insulation. This is what I'm building with at this little retreat center that I'm busy with now. And uh, when it's built, hmm, or even pretty soon before it's finished built, it's 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 nearly built. Hmm. Got to paint it and stuff, <laughs> lots of stuff. Um, but anyway, while that happens, uh, there are ideas about upgrading the video kind of presentation of the school, doing a little bit of editing with things maybe. Uh, playing more interview and discussion with students, with other teachers of the school and visiting teachers, friends of the school, etc. Um, some here, some online stuff when we get better internet stuff worked out here and uh, like that. Um, and at that point laptop talks will probably all get deleted and vanish away. So, you know, grab them and download them if you like them in the meantime. Okay. Um, anyway, so I'm not sure I'll see you in another laptop talk, but whether there or one way or another, um, some of the videos I make from now on will be public. Most will be secret because I'll be wanting to talk more about actual Tantra. Mm. Enough for this morning. Time for breakfast for me, I think.